joy in leveling criticism at the city clerk, but my uh, my Any member of council or audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such request before motion is proposed. And there were cards submitted for 4E. So 4E is pulled. Will someone move the balance of the consent calendar? So move. I'm second. I moved or you moved. Okay. I Whichever moved. one. Uh, roll call, please. I'm sorry. It was moved by Councilmember Agajanian and yes. seconded by? Quintero. Quintero. Thank you. Council members, Devine. Yes. Arpedian. Yes. Quintero. Yes. Agajanian. Yes. Mayor Najarian. Yes. 4E, please. Mayor and Council, 4E is Director of Community Development and City Attorney regarding acceptance of application for resubdivision of property generally located at the terminus of New York Avenue near Park Vista Drive. E1 is a resolution directing staff to accept and process for action applications for subdivision of property within lot A of County of Los Angeles, track number 10156, without the need for inclusion of all property within lot A or for consent of other owners of such property. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, the item before you pertains to the Mountain Oaks subdivision. Um, I think as, as you're all familiar, the Mountain Oaks subdivision was uh, created in uh, 1930. Uh, it was an illegal subdivision, meaning a subdivision map was recorded without the proper authority. At the time, the property was in the uh, Los Angeles County um, and was subsequently, subsequently annexed. Um, as a result of the illegal subdivision, at, since the time the property had been annexed, the city's long-held position was that it was an illegal subdivision, number one, and number two, that in order for somebody to develop th those lots or to uh, resubdivide them, or further resubdivide them for purposes of development, an application would be required that had the cons written consent of all the property owners up there. So there's 401 individual lots, and our position had been uh, for the over 50 years, at, uh, over 60 years, that uh, joint consent would be required to process an application. Um, over the years, we've received various letters of interest and, and even a challenge to that particular legal position, but it wasn't until 2017 that uh, the owner of a substantial majority of, the, of that subdivision filed, the, filed suit challenging the, the city's long-held uh, legal position. In 2018, uh, the Los Angeles Superior Court judge um, ruled that the city's position uh, was legally untenable, meaning that the city was required or is going to be required to accept uh, an application from uh, that owner who owns over 35 acres or approximately 35 acres of that property uh, for purposes of resubdivision. Um, that judgment, um, that, that decision was part of a larger lawsuit. So the lawsuit that was brought to, to in this action was for a, what's called a writ of mandate, which is basically an order of the court ordering some, a party to do something along with complaint for damages for things like takings and violation of due process. So that first part of that, that litigation resolved last year. Um, there have been other uh, activities going on in litigation that I can't get to, into too much detail on, but that writ will issue uh, once the judgment on the remaining causes of action is entered. Um, as a result, um, you know, it's our position that it's prudent at this time for the council to accept this writ of mandate decision and make a formal declaration that it would accept a subdivision application from any uh, fr from the property owner uh, that proposes to resubdivide the property. Um, the <coughs> position, uh, although we've, we found some disagreements with it, we believe that it's uh, would legal, from a legal perspective would be upheld. Um, given that this decision uh, is not a matter of, of when, it's a matter of if, in terms of us having being legally required to accept an application. Um, we, we believe it's prudent at this time to go ahead and formally make that declaration to avoid any future litigation costs and litigation risk. Um, and I don't want to say that ends the litigation because it doesn't, but it, it is certainly from a legal perspective, it provides some advantages to the city. Um, what this, this, all this action would do, again, would authorize the community development director and his staff to accept a resubdivision application when the, when the property owner comes in uh, with that application. Um, we're not agreeing to any type of development. Um, we're not approving any, any projects whatsoever. The project um, for that size of property on, on that, that type of land would, requ would require a full environmental, environmental impact report under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, and, and an applicant's going to have to show compliance with all the provisions of the city's general plan, our general municipal code, and subdivision map act. 
Um, so this is really just the first step, and, and, and the reason it was pre it presented in this manner because it's a, it's it's truly an initial procedural step. Um, there will be a lots of I'm sure discussions or, or public discussions about this as a project if and the applicant decides to go forward. Um, so that's that it, that's the rationale why we're bringing this forward to you at this time, um, and we're asked the council to adopt a resolution uh, uh, agreeing to accept an application. Uh, for the resubdivision of this property, um, and that that's specifically in the court's order that even though we're accept, required to accept an application, we are entitled to uh, put it through full through the full entitlement and environmental review process that the law allows. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Before I call the speakers up, I want to give a little history as to my involvement with uh, Mountain Oaks since I've been on the council, and I think it even goes back when uh, Mr. Quintero got on the council that it was our policy to absolutely reject any attempts for development of Mountain Oaks. Not just the development, but even the, the precursor, which is the subdivision of the lots that we claim, and I think we, many of us still hold on to the belief that they were illegally subdivided, which would, according to the law, require all the signatures of the property owners to permit the subdivision. Every single one of, and this has been an ongoing issue, it comes up every year, springtime, like the daisies. Uh, every single one of the council members uh, has stood firm in rejecting any development requests, applications, and even the basic subdivision. It was our, it was our thought that uh, if it's gonna, if this land is gonna be taken away, from the community, it's got to be taken away by someone wearing a black robe. Unfortunately, that's what has happened. There was a lawsuit filed, and among several other causes of action, one cause of action was to force the city to accept a subdivision of the Mountain Oaks tract. Does not mean that we're accepting development, any type of project, anything, uh, any construction at all. It's merely the subdividing of the land into lots without the required, we believed, uh, signature of all the property owners. And, and if I could just clarify again, yes. it's, it's only the application for the subdivision. So the subdivision isn't even being approved by this. It is only the application. An application to submit for resubdivision of the lots that they own. So this is not something that the council is happy about. We have fought this in court. We have spent and are continuing to spend significant amounts of attorney fees, uh, defending our legal position, which is in line with, I believe, the folks that are concerned about Mountain Oaks. But that's that's just where we are. So um, that being said, let me call up our first few speakers. Mary Lynn Fisher. Mary Lynn will be followed by Stephen Garcia. Good evening, Mayor Najarian and council members. My name is Mary Lynn Fisher. And Mr. Mayor, I do appreciate your filling me in on some history of this project. I've lived in far north Glendale, which I call La Crescenta, for more than 35 years. And I'm a member of the steering committee of the Crescenta Valley Community Association. I understand you've given some plausible reasons why the council should accept this resolution, but I'm here to urge you to postpone this action. There wasn't any public notice about this. I didn't know there was a lawsuit pending. What about the other owners of lots in this subdivision? Were they given any written notice that this action was going to be before the city council? It's very important that this be widely publicized. And there was a problem with what little late notice there was of this. The press release that the city issues refers to a Los Angeles County Superior Court decision requiring the city to accept a subdivision application from the property's owner. But the resolution clearly states that there has been no final court decision. The resolution doesn't give any reason, 
although you attempted to give one a few minutes ago, but anyone looking online and trying to understand what is going on here has no idea what's happening or why. The public is entitled to know the terms of any such a decision by the Los Angeles Superior Court, when such a decision will become final, and whether the city has thoroughly considered an appeal. Development of this land, as I now understand you understand, would destroy precious open space that contains protected oak trees. Why the rush to pass the resolution? Why not wait until these other causes of action have been determined? This litigation has been pending since 2017. It hasn't been concluded. Lots of things could happen before it is concluded. And as the North Glendale Community Plan states at page 87, and the mountainous undeveloped character should be maintained. When the city attorney was listing the various requirements with which any uh, application for development by the owners would have to comply, he didn't mention the North Glendale plan. And that's a real concern of mine. I would urge you to vote no on this resolution for now. Thank you. Stephen Garcia. Well, it's been years since I've been in front of your city council. And uh, I don't have nothing to do with Live Oaks. I mean, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here for a monthly housing subsidized program. And okay, but, sir, okay. we have a. I hate to interrupt you, but okay. we have another uh, portion of our uh, meeting where you're going to be able to speak. Okay, and it's not too far away. That's all right. It's, it's coming concerned. up maybe in about five ten minutes. Okay. So I'll call you up okay. on that one. And is there uh, are there any other cards on this one, Mr. Clerk? Four uh, E. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Garcia, would you mind addressing uh, the um, remarks made, or the questions made by Ms. Fisher? Certainly, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, so certainly some of those, those uh, comments are um, uh, understood in the context of, of um, the current condition of the property and the, current, the city's current uh, legal position, and, uh, which has been status quo, don't do anything. Um, and I think, and we certainly are happy to, to talk to any individual who wants to talk about the case where we're, I've made the, the decision available, and I, I believe we're, we're going to make it publicly available if any, to anybody who wants it. Um, but essentially what the court said was this. Um, it, it would be, uh, and they didn't say this, but this is how I characterize it. It would be essentially if somebody came in to get a building permit to build a new house uh, on their property, and uh, we are... Um, telling them that before you even apply, you have to get all your neighbors to agree to it. Um, and, and that's what the court said was, was not proper. There was a legal justification to create an exception to the Subdivision Map Act and for us to impose that joint, joint, use, joint requirement. Again, that's the court just said you can't do that, but you can go through the, the rest of the, the entitlement process um, and, and all the public comment that's surely going to happen, public hearings and public comment that's surely going to occur, um, not just public hearings, but obviously people will be able to comment on the EIR. Um, the project, uh, my understanding is it is within the North Glendale community plan boundaries and would certainly be subject to, I didn't mean to admit that, but that is certainly one of the, you'll have to show consistency with that plan uh, uh, in order to move forward. Um, so uh, th those things are all taken into consideration uh, at this point. Um, in term and again, to reiterate on the point of why not wait, um, the, the re Without getting into too much detail, I believe in, in council can free to, is free to speak on this. We have discussed the possibility of appeal and the likelihood of success on, on the merits in that appeal, and that's part of the reason why we're here tonight. Um, and then, uh, as far as there's no difference legally between doing this decision, there's no benefit legally to waiting than there is to doing it now. And there is there we do see benefits to taking care of this decision uh, now in, in the present um, to avoid future. Uh, risks and costs associated with litigation. Um, again, it does not eliminate or avoid the litigation entirely, but certainly provides additional um, uh, defenses uh, in that litigation to agreeing to accept the application at this point. 
Is the court accepting any more argument or briefing on the issue of no. the no. subdivision? No. So it's that part that, that's is basically decided. It's a ruling. Decided. It's a ruling. It's just not final. It's not a judgment. Because there are these other yeah. parts yeah. that are working themselves right. through the That part will not case. change by, by this judge. We'd have to appeal it. Um, and we'd have to spend, you know, as you noted, Mr. Mayor, we'd have to spend money to defend the remaining causes of action mm -hmm. and then see where that leads and then and then decide whether to appeal. And we've already talked about, about that issue. Thank you. Ms. Devine. And Ms. Fisher asked about an appeal. And um, you're, you're saying that there, we, we have no merit. There's no merit for an appeal. I don't want to say that. I didn't say that. Oh. I, um, but I, what I did say was, given the risks, um, it's, it's more in the city's interest to make the decision now to accept the, the application rather than um, risking further litigation on that point. Any other comments? Um. Mr. Garpetian? Thank you. So as far as notices to the neighbors, uh, have we sent them a notice on this on this uh, meeting or the litigation or? No, no, no specific notice has been sent about this meeting. I mean, obviously, it's it, it, the, the, other than the agenda, and I, I do understand that a number of folks um, up there have gotten the notice of, of the meeting and whatnot. There's no formal notice. Um, once once an application is submitted, if an application is submitted, I should say, um, then um, at that point there will be there will be multiple notices. There will be notices when we, you know, we dis we do a notice of preparation for the ER. Basically, say we're going to prepare an EIR. That goes out to everybody. People comment then. Then when the EIR goes out, people comment then. Then when we have public hearings before the planning commission and uh, city council, those will have notices. And then I would also note that I, I'd imagine. I can't guarantee. I'd imagine that in this with this type of project, the the applicant would probably have some community meetings um, themselves, um, just given the nature of the project. Okay, let me ask you one one more question about the the report. It says the court's ruling will not be final, and the writ of mandate will not issue until remaining uh, causes of action alleged in the lawsuit are resolved. What are those remaining? Of action. So there, there is one other cause of action, um, another writ of mandate cause of action that essentially the applicant is contending that our, our position affected a, a constitutional taking of, of its property. We're in some dispute of whether or not that, that's been resolved or not. Uh, but there are also other causes of action claiming that the city's actions constituted taking, violated the due process of the applicant. And as a result, that the applicant is entitled to monetary damages and attorney's fees as a result. We disagree with those, obviously. We would fight them. But um, those causes of action, which those, those causes of action would require more litigation than we've currently done to date. We have, you have discovery at that point. And you have um, um, other, so, you know, additional litigation beyond what we've done to, to date. So regardless of us voting for this resolution tonight or not, the rest of the items are still in litigation. Correct. And the judge will not uh, finalize his decision because the other issues are not resolved? Cor that's correct. So if we win some of those issues, like taking, I mean, we all have a strong position on that, that our action w did not cause taking, uh, would that uh, make a difference on the results of the, this action, and may, the judge may say, "No, you don't have to take this application." No, I don't. I don't believe so. no, because that's that's a separate issue. What the court ruled is that under the Subdivision Map Act, we're legally required to um, accept this application. So that's that's that. The only way to change that decision would be to appeal it. The other causes of action would say, as a result of the city's decision not to accept the application, you caused us damages because you caused us you, you violated our due process. So. Basically, the judge made a decision on that item that we have to take an application. Correct. But the rest is not finalized because we still are different items that we're fighting for. That's that's correct. So basically, this item is finalized. I want to I want to understand it so the public will understand it too. That this when it says there is no judgment yet, it's not finalized right. yet. It's not because uh, this this portion of that judgment is not finalized. This portion is finalized, but the rest is still going well the judgment has been issued so we're not under a court order to uh, to accept an application we're, that won't occur until after after the the writ is issued in conjunction with the judgment on the rest of the causes of action so what but, no. but the writ 
what will not change. That decision that she made will not change. And so that's why we're, if it's not going to change and we're not going to appeal it, we should comply with it now to avoid, or at least to help us in the litigation and to just uh, put that issue to bed, so to speak. Okay, of course. Question, uh, Mr. piggybacking on that that one. So, did you say that they cannot um, uh, re request for an application until the final decision, the mandate is made? And, and either we have to agree to accept an application, which is what we're here for tonight, or um, uh, yeah, if the, oh. we don't do that, then we, we will not be legally obligated to accept an application until the writ is issued uh, and a judgment entered. And then, so then, I know we're going around in circles, but then what is the worst case scenario, uh, Mr. City Attorney, if we don't rule on this tonight, approve this tonight? What's the worst case scenario? I, I'm a little hesitant to put that. Um, it, it, it affects our position in the litigation, right. and I, I don't want to say more than that. I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's in our beneficial and financial interest as a city to agree to accept an application uh, now because we have a court order that we know is going to come in at some point and that's not going to change and uh, you know my thoughts on uh, an appeal and so it, it it's in our interest financially um, and as fiduciaries of that organization um, I'm strongly in the strongest terms asking you to adopt this resolution tonight okay mr. Quintero I was going to say from my perspective I mean we're basically both the city and the property owner surrounding uh, this parcel. I mean, we're here for the long run. This doesn't go away. It certainly was part of the agenda many, many years ago when I served on the council. What I find interesting, it seems to be a succession of owners. Someone comes in, buys the property, perhaps, I think they buy the property, whatever it is, they go on to litigate, come up with these grandiose plans. So I think what we need to do is look at the final uh, goal. And uh, I think we have to do this tonight. But it by no means means that uh, this city council is rolling over and somehow <coughs> going to make it easy for this uh, developer to go on. They're going to have to go through a, a process which is going to be quite exhausting. Mr. Carpet. Yes, just one more point of clarification. So until they get the final judgment, they cannot submit an application. Am I true, correct or not? Unless we, unless we allow it. Unless we allow it. Right. So if we allow it and uh, they submit an application while we're litigating the other issues, we cannot appeal it at that time anymore because we allowed it. That's correct. Okay. And based on your professional opinion, the outcome will not change yes, sir. from what's, what's there today. That's correct, yes, sir. Okay. And for the public to know, I mean, even if you, tonight this resolution goes through and we, we accept to accept an application, we approve to accept an application, it doesn't mean that they're going to submit an application tomorrow, that it's acceptable for Subdivision, design, every process has an appeal period. Every process has to go through the different process. Subdivision, then, then design review. And they have to comply with every code that's in our books. So it's not that we are, we are giving them a, a free ride of, of having an application. But my, I thought that we had a, a, a judgment on this already, but we have an opinion. So. Okay, Mr. Quintero, you were going to make a motion at 4E1? Yeah. I'll make Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Council members Devine? Yes. Arpedian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Agajanian? Yes. Aaron Ajarian? Yes. Next item, please. Next item on the agenda is the council and staff. Let me start with my left. Mr. Carpetian. Starting from left. Okay. Um, couple of fun items uh, because we had one night uh, the the holiday uh, on ice the ice skating rink where we had a grand opening it says very successful 
uh, venue we started in the city. Hopefully, will continue for many years. Uh, the residents are very happy, as far as I know. We get a lot of positive feedback on that. I want uh, to interrupt you. We have film. Go ahead. At 11. <laughs> Don't oh, you're more prepared than I. Was. I was going to raise it, but okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. there we go. I don't know whose so, idea that was, but it was a good idea. I discovered that. <laughs> it's, it's the council's idea. These are, this is a, a great program we have. Uh, as, again, it's, it is successful. Hopefully, will people come, up, come out and, and enjoy their time on the ice. It's very uh, you know, Christmas-related, holiday-related. So it's a, it's a great, great uh, venue. Um, I also participated with the... Uh, Arminius Fund Teleton. This is a, a Teleton that has been going on for the last 27 years. We raise, they raise funds to do different projects in, in, in Armenia. So I think they raised over $10, $10 million this year. So that was a successful event as well. I also participated in a tree lighting ceremony at Montrose, uh, Montrose Shopping Park Association. They always have, it's short but very sweet. It's a, it's a great, great uh, ceremony. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, I want to raise the issue of uh, the vaping, Mr. City Manager. Uh, you know, I know we discussed it one, once before, but I want to make sure it's going to come back. The report's going to come back, and it's going to be agendized so we can discuss it. Because Los Angeles Unified School District and Glendale Unified School District uh, both have filed a lawsuit against Juul, uh, the largest e-cigarette manufacturing company. Uh, there have been serious cases of lung diseases among youth and several deaths uh, just in the last few years. As of October 2019, Center of Disease Control has filed 1,200 cases of lung injuries in the U.S. that were linked to, to vaping. And the list goes on and on. Uh, flavored e-cigarettes were intentionally introduced uh, into the market, especially to target youth. So with all school districts, uh, I'm just going to read a couple of uh, their their news, couple of items on their news news uh, release. Uh, student vaping uh, incidents throughout Glendale Unified have increased significantly in recent years, and as alleged in the compl complaint, the vaping epidemic will continue to challenge the uh, academic achievements of all Glendale Unified school students as the district is forced to divert resources, time, and effort to combat this issue. So with that. Uh, Madam City Manager, I want to, uh, I know Council has inquired about this potential ban on the safe, on the sale of the flavored e-cigarettes, vaping products, and we received a report a few weeks ago uh, from, the, from, from the staff, but uh, I would like to request for a report to come back to City Council regarding this item. If I uh, get a second on that. Do I need a second? second. That or? Yes, okay. and, and Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, um, we did provide uh, the Council with a, a a memo uh, a few weeks ago, um, and uh, Ms. Devine had also asked for uh, information to come back. Um, so this is good that you brought it up at the dais, um, and we will definitely bring back a report. Um, Thank you. you. You have a second and a third, <laughs> so we'll definitely bring it back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Didn't I bring this up a couple months yes, ago? Yes, you did. Yeah, you did. Provided the report, Mr. Mayor, initially to so, give you some so background information. I think we want an ordinance. Pardon? Uh, I think we mm -hmm. want an ordinance mm -hmm. at this We're point. We're going to bring that yeah. forward. Don't make an urgency. Emergency. Do you have any comments? Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Virginia? I just uh, want to ask, maybe the city attorney, why we don't join the lawsuit? That was my concern I was going to ask you. There's a lawsuit pending. Don't we have standing to join that lawsuit? Good question. We will look at that. Yeah, I mean, it's, the school districts definitely have um, uh, a better case for standing, but we certainly we can look at that and see what other cities have decided to no, participate. No, because uh, they're suing for the kids who are attending right. the uh, Glendale High School and Middle School, probably. So but they are yeah. our kids. We are representing. No, I, I think they're also. also uh, so there's probably costs run. to the school districts associated with vaping. You know, additional health care costs and that sort of thing. I think that's what the basis that's is. Sense. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but we'll certainly look at it and see what other cities are doing in that regard. Ms. Devine? Um, I just wanted to add uh, a comment about the uh, Armenian Fund uh, Telethon. They were raising funds to uh, uh, provide solar and water to Artsakh and Armenia. Uh, so they're ab actually... Uh, going to put renewables in Artsakh and Armenia, and I think that a, was a very commendable uh, fundraiser, and uh, uh, it's a, a good sign uh, for the um, country of Armenia. So um, congrats to the Armenian Fund. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have a few items. This Friday at what time? 6.30? We're going to have our Christmas tree lighting in Perkins Plaza. What's our time on that? Who knows? 6.30. 6 o'clock. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. There's going to be Christmas caroling, hot chocolate, and the lighting of our huge Christmas tree. On Saturday is the Montrose uh, Christmas Parade which I was thinking what annual it is, but it's been going on for decades. So come down and line Honolulu Avenue and you'll see uh, all your favorite groups and Christmas characters and Santa Claus will come by and it's a great time for all. The weather might be um, frightful that day, but uh, that keeps us in the spirit. So that's gonna be Saturday, the Montrose Christmas Parade. And the ice skating rink is still open. It's going to be open through January 6th. And the skates are available. It's, uh, you can skate all day. Rent your skates and skate all day. Uh, and they're even open when there's a little bit of drizzle out there. So, uh, is it free that and, day when it rains? And there's no rain checks, I don't think, for that. Um, so... It's right outside City Hall, and we see a lot of kids having a good time, so that's great. I don't have any other comments. Any staff <coughs> comments? Okay, let's go to the next item. Next item on the agenda is the community event announcements. There was one card submitted for that portion. This is followed also by the three-minute general public comment period. I believe there was also a card submitted for that. Okay, I'm going to call up Mr. Garcia, who has been waiting. He'll be followed by Bill Weissman. Well, I see you guys take an interest in vaping. That's, uh, if any of your students or anybody here in the city of Glendale gets sick and ends up in the hospital almost dead, it's because there's vitamin E inside the vaping. That's killing people. That's all I know about it. But I'm here for a different program. I'm here for your new monthly housing subsidized program. I don't think it's fair, okay? I'm homeless. It says seniors, disabled, renters, households, low income, all right? I went to your lottery, put it in, tried winning down there on Los Feliz and San Fernando. I lost by one number. I'm not saying it was, it's legal, you know, on the lottery. I lost by one number, 657 or six, off by one number. <laughs> but this one here, I think, is, it came out right after the, that lottery. So I thought, well, it doesn't say anything about homelessness. So I thought maybe if you guys could rewrite it and put it in so homeless people get an extra $300 a month, that'd be nice, you know. I mean, you, all these people, the man said there's over 2,000 people that applied for this. And I'm thinking their rent must be pretty low <laughs> to live here in Glendale. They must have nice landlords or something. But um, 
If you guys could take it into consideration to rewrite this program so it allows homeless people, seniors and disabled homeless people to get some of those $300 a month for 24 months, that'd be more than appreciative. So that's all I'm here to ask about. I appreciate your time and effort. And, you know, your meeting's been interesting tonight. Uh, I haven't sat through one of these in quite a few years since uh, maybe Ginger, somebody, and Howard Scott. <laughs> and they weren't very friendly to me because I worked with your skateboard park up there, and they did not want it. So I'm glad you guys it took me three years in small claims court to get them to build it. And so, but I think that'd be nice if you could do that. You know, I don't know whose money it is, or does the money's not allowed to go to homeless people, or just people that have housing here. I don't know anything about that. But I thought I'd ask because they down there at that office they didn't know either, so I thought I'd ask you people. And that's about it. So I appreciate everything, and it's nice meeting everybody here. And have a good day, and thank you again. Thank you. Bill Weissman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, city council members, city staff, and the public. My name is Bill Weissman, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Glendale Beautiful to announce that the annual Fiesta de las Luminarias uh, celebration is going to take place on Friday and Saturday, December 13th and 14th, at Glendale's historic Casa Adobe de San Rafael, which is located at 1330 Dorothy Drive. Uh, we'd like to invite uh, everyone in the city uh, to join us for this free event at the historic Casa. Um, the luminarias are uh, beautiful, and we'll light them up uh, evening of Friday the 13th, and weather permitting, they'll also be on display Saturday the 14th. Uh, Friday the 13th, there will be a cacao ceremony with sound bath. And I don't think I have enough time to explain exactly what that is, but please use uh, your favorite internet search engine to look up cacao ceremonies. Uh, Saturday the 14th at 3 p.m., there will be a performance by the Ballet Folklorico Mexico, and we'll have a pinata with candy for the kids. And uh, at 5 p.m., a piano recital on the uh, old antique piano uh, that uh, is in the Casa living room. So again, that's going to be Friday and Saturday, December 13th and 14th, 7 p.m. Friday, starting 3 p.m. Saturday. It's a free event. The address again, 1330 Dorothy Drive in Glendale. And we hope to see everyone there. Thanks very much. And I think... Everyone uh, on the dais has a flyer. If anyone in the audience uh, would like a flyer, uh, please come get one from me uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So are you back, Bill? Is this a return to council involvement, or are you, is this a special cameo for the Dundo well, Beautiful? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to disengage completely, uh -huh. but uh, okay. we're, uh, Sharon and I are engaged on a... Uh, a quest to go to as many live music events as possible. I so I'll follow you on Facebook. Our you time, lucky. energy, and money mostly. On you that. lucky guys. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Are there any other cards? This is. I think this is all we have. No, so, there are no other cards. Okay, so this portion of oral communications is closed. Is this a card or it's something? For the next item. That's the next item. Okay, and let's move on to the next item, please. Next item is City Manager regarding consideration of direct allocation of funding for 2020 Census Education and Outreach. A1 is a motion authorizing City Manager to execute an agreement to receive a direct funding allocation from the city, County of Los Angeles in the amount of $147,789. Two is a resolution of appropriation of $147,789. Three is a motion to pool funding with the County of Los Angeles to decline direct funding allocation. Thank you, Ms. Beers. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Christine Powers will give you an update on all of our um, involvement with the census that is coming up in 2020 and to ask for your approval uh, to accept $147,789 uh, in outreach 
and education um, programming for the 2020 census from the County of Los Angeles. With that, Ms. Powers. Ms. Powers. Good evening, Mayor Najari and members of council and staff. So we've talked about the census a few times. We started talking about the census at the beginning of the year. Um, and now as we get closer to census day in 2020, uh, we get to start talking about funding. So we know that we count for many important reasons, a portion, um, how we draw our congressional and state legislative districts, how federal funding gets distributed, how we inform our planning decisions, and how we inform organizational decisions. Um, and it's important to note that when we count that the census is confidential, the Census Bureau takes an oath of confidentiality, all their members, and the Census Bureau is not even able to share information back with agencies from which they obtain information. They can only give a final count um, and can't share line item details. So the census is unique this year in that people can take the census online. This self-respond ability will start March 12th of 2020 and people will be able to take the census online and by phone. And really what the Census Bureau is trying to do is trying to push people to take the census in those first two ways and they're not actually going to start sending out paper forms until past census day, April 1st. So they're going to wait till about mid-April to send out the paper forms to really get people to um, submit on those um, two other ways. And then follow-up by door-to-door -door knocking will start in about May. And the apportionment count will go to the president by the last day of 2020. And redistricting will start in March 2021. So census funding, why this report is before you today, the L LA County received over 9.3 million from the state of California for outreach for hard to count census tracts. And the county has identified $147,789 for the city of Glendale to use for census promotion. Burbank, um, they were identified as being eligible for about 25% of what we have in Pasadena about 50% just to put it in con mm. comparison. So they're going based on our last census count and recognizing that um, there was an undercount as we've discussed before in the 2010 census. And so they've apportioned more funding for Glendale to use um, for outreach. And um, some cities weren't even um, eligible for any funding. And exhibit two of your report shows um, the breakdown of census funding specifically for the San Fernando Valley Cog region. So that does include um, Burbank, but it won't include Pasadena's figure. So our options for census allocation, option one is a pool fund. So that would be to not take the money, to decline a direct allocation, to pool our funding with the county and other cities. And for that, they, the county will give us a digital media kit, a direct mail campaign, and earned and paid campaign, which means they would be put, placing ads for us um, in local papers and local places that is reflective of our community. We would not have direct control of that. We would have some level of input, but ultimately the county would be making those decisions. Option two, which is staff's recommendation, is for the city to take that funding, city deployment of state funding. Um, with that, we have to create a complete count committee, which we already have. Um, create a strategic implementation plan, which is exhibit three of your report. And then after that, do extensive reporting, which um, staff is willing to do. So the strategic implementation plan is really to take a local grassroots approach to reaching as many people as possible in the city of Glendale, especially those that are least likely to respond. And our goals are to raise census awareness among all residents and capture the most complete and accurate count. Our strategies um, include conducting equitable offline research, developing modern interactive crowdsource maps and resources, talking to our trusted members of our community, and those are people who are on our complete count committee, investing in uh, digital literacy and marketing this very widely and organizing our key institutions. So the main takeaway, what we really want people to know is that the census is valuable. It impacts our schools, it impacts healthcare, it impacts our emergency response and other community services. And to make sure people know that they can, um, how they can take the census and make those means available to them should they not be able to do that on their own. So the target populations that we are looking at, which are traditionally considered hard to count, um, which we will be focusing on are immigrants and non-English speakers young children under the age of five, people with disabilities and special needs, homeless and older adults. And the strategic implementation plan does detail um, the key activities associated with e targeting each of these hard to count areas. 
And then as far as our media and advertising, our media strategy will ensure that the campaign uh, promotes and educates residents, um, co conveys our key messaging, outlines that this is confidential, um, and that we coordinate with LA County um, Complete Count Committee and their media relations team to make sure we don't duplicate efforts. That's a really important piece. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things for the census. We want to make sure we're not duplicating any of those efforts and we're using that funding as wisely um, as efficiently as possible. And then also a part of our media and advertising will be to create culturally appropriate branding and messaging to reach our hard to count uh, population. So the language access plan, we do have a language access plan to make sure that people with limited English, proficient English, limited English proficient individuals and people with disabilities are part of Glendale's um, hard to count populations and that we get to them. Um, and so as we do for our elections, we will be um, translating all our materials into um, the main four languages that we have here in Glendale, our top languages, Armenian, Spanish, Tagalog, and Korean. Um, now when folks go online to take the census, Armenian is not going to be one of those languages. The Census Bureau has translated the questions into Armenian, so it'll just be a matter of us taking that information, providing additional translation materials, and connecting the dots for people so that maybe they can take the um, census online by using a print version as a guide. And then um, just a little bit more information about our language access plan. We will be doing translations. We already have a contract with translation services here at the City of Glendale that we'll utilize. We'll take whatever we can get that the uh, Census Bureau and the county translates so that we are not translating duplicate materials. And we will um, distribute all this information through our trusted messengers. Our timeline, um, where we're at now, October to December, we've established our commute complete count committee and we are utilizing various methods to educate um, our leaders and so that they can reach out to their communities and raise awareness and encourage participation. From January to March we will ramp up our awareness campaign for the general population and then mid-March to end of April we'll promote self-response across the community. We will open Census Questionnaire Assistance Center so that'll be at our libraries and our, park, and our parks facilities with our trained staff to help people to come in so that they can take the census utilizing our resources should they not have those resources at their fingertips. And if we feel that at the end of the day this funding is not enough and say come January, February we need to um, put in additional funding to reach our target population, staff will come back to council um, and request additional uh, funding. But at this point um, count, uh, staff is asking council to approve uh, the funding that LA County has um, identified for us. And Eliza Papazian, our public information officer who is instrumental in putting together the strategic implementation plan is also here. If you have any questions for either of us, thank you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, report. Are there any other questions? I have a card first. Uh, Mike Mohill. 8A. Oh. That's okay. Oh. Someone misread it as a Okay, that's okay. I can. I, can. Um, I have no cards on this item. If there's any questions, now's the time. If not, there's items at 8A, 1, 2, and 3. I'll move the items at 8A, 1, 2, and 3. Thank you. Second. We have a second. Roll call, please. Council members Devine? Yes. Arpedian? Yes. Guerrero? Yes. Avajanian? Yes. Avajanian? Yes. Next item, please. Next item has been taken off calendar. It is 8B. Okay. I'll just read it uh, into the record and state that it's been moved to the December. Sorry, can we? I apologize. I didn't catch the uh, on the action item. 8A3 was a was a separate was contrary to 8A1. So I can ask council to, to uh, make a motion to uh, rescind the approval 8A3. Uh, so oh, I see. To okay. decline the direct, we'll right. take the direct funding. Correct. Rather than pooling. It. Is there a motion to reconsider item 8A3? Um, it should be reconsidered with the same meeting and then just, just vote no. Yeah, well, you don't have to vote no. You just don't. It'll just, just don't deal. bring it up. Don't bring it up. Is there a motion to reconsider? Move. Ms. To Devine? Reconsider. Second. Roll call, please. Council members Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Agajanian? Yes. Aaron Ajarian? Yes. And we'll take no action on 8A3. And now move to 8B. Is that correct? We'll just let it sit yeah, there. That's correct. Okay. 
AB is General Manager of Glendale Water and Power regarding amendment number three to contract number C106642 with uh, Vaughn's Industrial Repair Company. That has been taken off, uh, well, that has actually been moved to uh, the December 10th meeting. 8C is Director of Public Works regarding 2019 State of California Requirement for Local Government Regulation of Taxi Cab Transportation Service. C1 is an ordinance for introduction, amending Chapter 5.84 of the Glendale Municipal Code, Taxi Cabs and Other Vehicles for Hire to comply with the California Government Code 53075.5. 5305.51. Thank you. Ms. Spears. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we'll go directly to Mr. Amrani, Public Works Director. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, with the passage of uh, recent regulations uh, by the State of California, uh, the City of Glendale's Municipal Code needs to be amended to conform with those regulations. As such, one of the main areas that uh, it was part of the recent regulations was the uh, issue of uh, a taxi cab being substantially located within a certain city and as such if they were located substantially located within a certain city they didn't have to basically go through all the permitting and inspection and regulations within other cities basically so we're just modifying our code to uh, be in conformance with the uh, uh, state of California regulations uh, however, we feel that with this, recommending this uh, amendment, that any uh, taxi cab company uh, that is operating within the city of Glendale but is substantially located in another city would not be sub uh, subject to having go through all the permitting and inspection and other regulations that uh, we would have. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I do have a card from John O'Bagdanian. Mr. Bagdani. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. John Bagdani, I represent the uh, taxi cab companies that are currently operating in the City of Glenda. Uh, I just I was here to answer any questions. I read the staff report today, uh, and I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, we've been involved as taxi companies involved in this new law, AB 1069 which the purpose of that was to basically streamline taxi regulations in order to make them more competitive with uh, transportation network companies, uh, Uber and Lyft. So uh, given that there's thousands or millions of trips that are currently operated by, uh, uh, are performed by uh, Uber and Lyft in all the cities to the tune of 26,000 pickups from LAX on a daily basis versus 4,000 4, pickups from uh, you know, LAX by taxis, you see the big difference. But none of these Uber vehicles go through the same regulatory requirements as taxis do. So therefore, there's a disadvantage in terms of taxis having to have a commercial license requirement, which they will, uh, background checks, which taxi companies want to have that, drug testing, which they are done, uh, and there is vehicle inspection, which is done by a third-party inspector right now. So the whole purpose of AB 1069 is to reduce all these regulations, such as uh, coming, going to the city, applying as an owner's permit, going to a transportation parking commission, setting up limits for the taxis. All of those are slowly but surely being removed by many cities that want to regulate, but they want to streamline it, or uh, they don't want to regulate at all whatsoever. So they say, okay, go get a permit from another city and you can operate. So under the current uh, uh, recommended staff, I respectfully agree that they made the change to the ordinance. However, there still has a lot of those origin, original uh, requirements that was in the city's ordinance. So therefore, these taxi companies will continue to, I, I assure you, will continue to operate in Glenda, provide services to Glenda because the major part of their services is access services, paratransit service for LA Metro. Uh, but not necessarily they may be uh, licensed in Glendale because we can go to the city of Burbank and have less fees, reduce the number. I mean, the process will be much faster and quicker. We don't have to pay as much inspection fees, and uh, the requirements are much easier. And the city of Burbank went just through a similar reduction in their ordinance. But at the end of the day, uh, it's still the uh, taxi companies want to operate in Glendale. They'll continue to provide the services at the hotels, at the Americana, and so on and so forth. There are very limited taxi stands in the city right now. There used to be nine or ten of them. Now they've been removed over time. 
technically nobody really goes to a taxi stand right now. They use an app or make a phone call. So practically speaking, that doesn't bother or impact the taxi companies, whether there is a taxi stand in Glender or not. We still will provide that uh, service. With that, I just wanted to assure you we will provide service. And if we have to license another city, it's not that Glendale is bad. It's, it's, it's easier to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frank Daniel. All right, are there any questions? I'll move the item. Second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Council Member is divine. Yes. Uh, Hold on a second. That's an ordinance. Ordinance, ordinance, for, ordinance. for introduction. Oh, ordinance for so introduction. So Ms. Divine Sorry. gets credit to introduce the ordinance. Yeah. Jumped again. 8D, please. 8D is Director of Public Works regarding ASNIAD facility maintenance services for electrical, flooring, general building repairs, painting, plumbing, and roofing systems for all city Glendale facilities. E1 is resolution dispensing with competitive bidding and awarding contracts per specification number 3809, 3832, 3811, 3812, 3813, 3814, authorizing city manager to execute <coughs> such contracts. Thank you, Ms. Beers. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, we'll go directly to Mr. Amrani again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Uh, Department of Public Works issued an RFP for services, as needed services related to electrical, flooring, general building repairs, painting, plumbing, and roofing system for all of our facilities. We received uh, proposals from several vendor, uh, vendors and we're respectfully recommending uh, uh, awarding the contracts uh, for as needed services to these vendors. Uh, these will be utilized on an as needed basis and uh, if there uh, if there's an issue that comes up they would submit a uh, we would submit a task uh, order request to them they will fill it out provide us with uh, their pricing and we have multiple vendors for each of these items so we would be able to select the best value for the city and move forward and i'll be happy to answer your questions are there any questions i have no cards i'll move d1 second thank you roll call please Council members Devine? Yes. Garpetti? Yes. Montero? Yes. Agajanian? Yes. Aaron Najarian? Yes. Next item. He is Director of Community Development regarding consideration of urgency legislation regarding accessory dwelling units, ADU. E1 is a motion initiating amendments to the Glendale Municipal Code pertaining to ADUs and junior ADUs. It was an introduction of an urgency ordinance establishing interim standards and ministerial processes for reviewing and approving applications for ADUs and junior ADUs. Three is a motion providing direction of staff regarding potential refunds of parks and libraries development impact. Mr. Garcia, before we begin this, um, at what point should I step away from the proceedings? Uh, correct. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, uh, staff will make a presentation on the accessory dwelling unit statute and uh, the proposed urgency legislation. The last item before you is the motion regarding the parks and library development impact fee, which uh, you have conflict given that it affects one of your financial interests so the the plan is to discuss all the op all the options what the state law requires what our ordinance have that discussion have council provides direction and then we can have a discussion on that last piece uh, after you recuse yourself okay so we'll do we'll discuss one and two first yes sir the items the the issues in one and two okay um, we'll go directly to Ms. Ass. Ms. Ass, directly <laughs> to you uh thank you mr mayor members of of council um, we are here to talk tonight about uh, an interim ordinance for ADUs. Um, as you can see, uh, well, back in October, the state passed a, a number of bills, um, and these are just six of them that relate to ADUs. Uh, I am uh, generally going to cover what the state law says and the first, and then uh, add uh, a few little uh, additions that our ordinance has uh, before you tonight. Uh, so primarily, uh, the four main components um, in the state statute are uh, some changes to allowable zones for ADUs, uh, some changes to development standards. There's a discussion about uh, four types of mandatory ADUs, and I'll cover those more briefly. But uh, essentially, they are uh, there are two versions in a single-family situation and two versions in a multifamily situation. There are some changes to the processing requirements as well as to development impact fees. 
To start with review and approval, uh, ADUs must be reviewed administratively. This means no discretionary review, such as design review. The time to act on a permit uh, is has been reduced, it's been shortened uh, to 60 days uh, to review a complete application. The uh, current law uh, was previously 120 days. When an ADU is proposed concurrently with a new single family dwelling, uh, that processing uh, will run in accordance with review of the single family dwelling, um, not the 60 days. But again, ADUs are not uh, to be reviewed. Um, uh, are, are to be reviewed ministerially. If a complete application is not acted on within 60 days, it shall be deemed approved. So as far as zones, ADUs are, will, will now be allowed in all zones that permit residential uses. So this includes single family zones, multifamily zones, including commercial and mixed use zones. Uh, jurisdictions may only restrict locations of ADUs based on adequacy of water and sewer, impact of an ADU on traffic flow, and public safety. City cannot require owner, owner occupancy, an owner occupancy requirement. Uh, that's where uh, an owner has to live on site in either the ADU or the primary dwelling unit. Um, however, this provision sunsets in 2025 but any ADU units built between January 1st, 2020 and December 31st, 2024 uh, remain exempt from this owner occupancy requirement. However, any owner occupancy cover covenant that was executed prior to January 1st, 2020 is enforceable. And there is a provision that allows the owner occupancy requirement for junior ADUs. So that's us, right? We have an owner. Our, our, current, our, our current. current law requires owner occupancy. This would remove that, other than the provisions I mentioned before. So, just a Mr. Question Question. So, if if you have a permit before 2020, you're subject to it, or you have an occupancy uh, certificate of occupancy, you're subject to it because there are two different things. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Councilmember Garpetian, I think to the extent that a covenant has been executed, that covenant is enforceable. Um, if somebody has a permit, well, and they wouldn't have, they would have a, they would have signed the covenant before they got their, um, before they got their permit. So that that would be enforceable. Um, that wouldn't necessarily stop somebody that was in the middle of construction from withdrawing their permit and applying a new, I, I presume. So the only covenants that would be enforceable are those that are in place for an existing ADU that has a covenant. Um, and then anything that receives a permit after January 1st is going to be exempt from that owner occupancy requirement. So again, if <clears throat> so again, if you pull your permits before January 2020, uh, and you completed your your construction, you're subject to it. If you are in the middle of the construction, you don't have your occupancy permit yet. The only way for you to be exempt from it is to just uh, pull another, you know, return your permits and pull another permit, stop your construction. How could that be? We'd have to look at that a little bit more closely, but all I can tell you is at the point that they have their permits, they will sign the covenant. That covenant is enforceable if it's been executed before January 1. Um, we'd have to figure out what happened. We'd have to see what an applicant would propose in that situation. So when you pull your permit, you sign the covenant? Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on. Um, so again, state law will permit conversions, um, uh, will allow conversions for ADUs in any accessory building, so not just a garage. So this could be a pool house, a cabana, a recreation room, a workshop. So it's not just uh, not just garages. Um, any existing building can be converted to an ADU. Uh, we are allowed to regulate development standards, uh, including parking, height, setback, landscape, design review, and the like. Um, but we are prohibited from enforcing any minimum lot uh, lot size requirements, which uh, Glendale currently does not do. As for setbacks, no setback can be required for conversion of existing buildings. Uh, again, not just garages, as I stated earlier. And we cannot require more than a four foot minimum interior. This is your side <coughs> and rear setback for all other ADUs. That requirement was previously at five feet. Excuse me. Um, How about um, Mr. Quintero, then the Mr. setback between the uh, single family home and the ADU? Is there any? There's not necessarily a requirement. Um, uh, listed in this, uh, our, our uh, municipal code uh, says that a detached 
something is detached when there is a five foot separation from eave to eave. So I think it'll make a difference of whether or not it's an attached ADU or a detached ADU. Mr. Agajini. Yes. yes. Um, there are lots of old houses in Glenda. You know, most of the houses are old anyway. And the garage, whether it's right on the uh, borderline or very close to borderline, like maybe a feet away from the uh, borderline. So if they change it to ADU, uh, it's okay. They That's don't have to have four feet, uh, they don't have to have four feet, to be four feet away from the borderline, right? That's correct. If it's a conversion of an existing building, right. such as a garage, you can keep the zero, six inches, one foot, three feet. Okay, thank you. One more question. Mr. So Pinto. one more question. So the scenario that Mr. Agajanian is describing, an older garage, to knock that older garage down right down to the foundation and go up from, from there, there's still no requirement for a setback? There's still no requirement for a setback if you are demolishing that existing structure and are replacing it with an ADU, but it has to be to the same size and dimension of that of that building yeah. that was demolished anything new you're going to have to comply with the setback if you want to pr uh, propose extend it a little bit you're going to have to you're going to have, have the four foot minimum the setback if you want oh, okay. something so, beyond that, right, in that existing case, structure knock it all down you're going to go with a four, four feet, feet and then you can it's only if you attempt to rehab that garage and convert it no that's not what four. she's saying She's saying that if you knock that garage down and build a new one with the same square footage, same area, same footprint of the older garage, you don't have to comply with the four-foot setback. But if you build, you want to extend it and build it a little larger, then you have to say, am I, am I correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. So if it's the same size, you don't have to. Okay. Is it, can I ask, yes. is that something that we can change with, the, with the, a different ordinance, the setback? Uh, for the our, our reading of the statutes, that's a requirement that we have to comply with. We can't be more more strict than that. Um, we can't. So we have to allow the, set, the setbacks to remain, and if they're going to if they're going to convert or demolish or reconstruct in the same place, we have to comply with that. We can't have a different uh, development standard. We, but could we? Ch I guess in a new construction, could we say it has to be if if it's going to be well, new maybe? construction as long as it's not if it's bigger. Not in the same location or not the same dimension, then yeah, you can require a new setback. But then even then, it's, four, it's limited to four feet uh, interior setback. No, four feet interior. Okay. okay. As for as for sizes of of accessory dwelling units, uh, the minimum size uh, that must be allowed for an efficiency unit is 150 square feet. Uh, the maximum uh, that must be allowed is at least 850 square feet or a thousand square feet for ADUs that are two bedrooms or greater. Uh, and I should point out um, for, for discussion purposes, junior ADUs, uh, junior accessory dwelling units, uh, are limited to 500 square feet in size. Development standards such as lot coverage, open space, and floor area ratio must be waived to permit an ADU that meets a maximum of 800 square feet. Uh, no more than 16 feet in height and has a minimum four foot interior setback. Uh, I ask you to remember these three key ingredients because they will be a running theme as I describe the four types of mandatory ADUs next. <laughs> uh, so into the, the four types of mandatory ADUs, as I mentioned that there are, there are two that apply to single family and two that apply to, to multifamily. Um, the next two slides cover lots that have only a single family unit on the property. It can be in any zone, but only in a situation where the existing condition is a single family lot or a single family unit. One ADU or junior ADU uh, must be allowed within the existing or proposed single family unit as long as there is exterior access. Uh, if uh, it would allow an expansion up to 150 square feet of the existing uh, building, but only to permit ingress or egress and that there are sufficient setbacks uh, established for fire safety and in consultation with building and safety, we've established that at three feet. And in addition, um, 
you can have one detached accessory dwelling unit, um, again, that is not more than 800 square feet, limited to 16 feet in height, and has a minimum four foot interior setback. And as I stated earlier in the slide previous, um, this, may, this situation may be combined with a junior accessory dwelling unit on the same lot. So you, would have, you could have a situation of a single family house with a junior ADU within the single family house as well as a detached ADU under those, those three conditions. Uh, for a multifamily situation, this is again on a lot where there are multi multiple units uh, on a lot. It allows multiple ADUs within an existing multifamily building. And I say that within the building, not within the units themselves. Um, it would be an example would be conversion of spaces not used as livable space. A storage room, a boiler room, a basement, an attic, garages, things of that nature. But that conversion uh, uh, into an ADU must, be, must meet all building code standards. In these situations, we must allow up to 25% uh, of the existing units in a building or one unit, whichever is greater. Example of this would be if there are eight units uh, on the property, a uh, maximum of two units can be uh, ADUs uh, can be put within the multifamily building. So what, it, what happens to the situation, and I know there are several um, multi-family units that have an illegal unit added on or converted. Can you convert that illegal under a ADU and make it legal? Arguably, there's another provision of the state law, not this bill, but one of the other bills that requires a delayed enforcement. Um, so it might be something that could be done as long as it wasn't viol a, a violation of health and safety, meaning it wasn't a risk to health and safety. The building official says it's not, doesn't pose a risk to he human health or safety. That's, that's plausible. That's, depending on the circumstances. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so again, the, the fourth situation, again, in the multifamily uh, situation. So if you are not converting any part of your multifamily building, uh, you have the option to propose two detached ADUs on an existing lot with multifamily units. Again, limited to 800 square feet in, uh, in size, 16 feet in height, and four foot interior setbacks. When you say multifamily, how many units and up, or there's no limit? Multifamily would mean anything more than one, so you'd have to have two and up. So if it's it would two, apply to, you can have to any property that has two or more units, so including mixed use, include, you know. I mean, if there's two units, zone, yeah. so you can have two ADUs then. Mm -hmm. if, if they're detached, if you're not yeah. using the provision of number so one, of the first slide. Like four units now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, two two multifamily dwelling units and two ADUs. And uh, how about the ratio of uh, improvement and property uh, and the lot size? The FAR. FAR. Yes. Those don't apply when you're using these when you're using blown these four out. mandatory. Blown out by the state. So there is no of FAR. Blown out. Okay, that's fine. Uh, parking can't require the maximum parking uh, we can require is one space per bedroom or per ADU, whichever is less. Uh, that means no parking is required for an efficiency or a studio ADU. We must allow tandem parking, uh, which our code uh, already does. An example of that would be two cars on a on a ten foot wide driveway back to back. Uh, the more significant change is that if, exist, if an existing parking area is converted like a garage uh, to an ADU, you do not have to replace that required parking that was in the garage. So, right, so you used to be able to, you used to have to replace it, but you didn't necessarily have to provide it as covered parking, you just had to provide it somewhere on the site. Now, it's not even required to be replaced at all. Uh, some other instances where uh, no parking is required, uh, if the ADU is within uh, and this is a, a clarification from the previous code, within a half mile walking distance, as opposed to just a half mile of public transit, that includes uh, any bus stop. If it's in a historic district, uh, if they are part of the existing primary, uh, primary residence or accessory structure, 
in areas on streets where parking permits are offered but not uh, are required but not offered to ADUs or within one block of car share vehicles. Well, is it, isn't that all of them? I mean, that part of the existing primary residence or a converted accessory structure. I mean, that's like basically all of them, isn't it? This will cover a substantial portion. No parking. Uh, no parking. In, in a number of cases, yes. Uh, some additional limitations, um, uh, I think, as the city attorney referred to uh, earlier, uh, may not require correction of non-conforming zoning conditions as a condition of approval. Uh, no fire sprinklers uh, may be required unless they are required uh, in the primary residence, and it voids any CCNRs that would prohibit or restrict ADUs. Change to impact fees. ADUs that are less than 750 square feet, so 700, 749 square feet and below, uh, no uh, impact fees can be collected. At 750 and greater, um, development impact fees can be charged proportionally in relation to the primary dwelling unit square footage. Connection fees, capacity charges. Uh, again, ADUs that are developed under those mandatory provisions, no connection fee or capacity charges uh, may be collected unless it's in conjunction with a proposed new single family home. All other ADUs, connection fees or capacity fees, um, are charged proportionate to the, bur the burden of the ADU connection. So our ordinance, the urgency ordinance uh, before you tonight for introduction uh, states that um, if it doesn't comply with the government code section, uh, it's null and void. It implements most of the state provisions with a couple of modifications and additions. Uh, we have added um, a permission to allow ADUs above existing detached garages, but we've limited that to 500 square feet, 24, 25 feet in height with a minimum of four foot interior setback. We've added that uh, junior ADUs uh, have a sink in the efficiency kitchen. We prohibit new construction of ADUs that are located between the primary dwelling and the street front or street side setback line. And we also prohibit an accessory living quarters uh, known as guest houses in our code uh, when a lot already has an ADU. For parks and library, the, uh, the development impact fees, uh, we propose a, a cap of $4,700. Uh, $4, um, it is based on the state formula proportional. And then finally, ADU ordinances. Um, when this is finished, we must send it to the state for review. So there's a number of alternatives for council to consider tonight uh, to initiate zoning code amendments to make a permanent ordinance as well as introduce this urgency ordinance, decline to in initiate the amendments but still introduce the urgency ordinance, initiate uh, <laughs> the amendments and decline to, to introduce the urgency ordinance or any other alternative not listed. I'll hold you yeah, we we'll stop there, have the other discussion after. Okay. So, available for any questions, but that concludes All right. the bulk of the presentation. Um, I do have two speakers. I have Mike Mohill, followed by Kathy Yurka. Good evening, council members. My name is Mike Mohill. My house is my castle. <clears throat> and like many, my wife and I worked hard to save enough money to move from apartment living into a single family residential neighborhood. We did not work to have the state legislature encroach into our privacy when the progressive Democrats in Sacramento forced two ADUs, accessory dwelling units, into our neighborhoods. Tonight, the discussion is about the city of Glendale adopting and approving Glendale State Assemblywoman Laura Friedman co-authored Assembly Bill AB 68. Her bill created the right to build two units of new rental housing on any single family lot in California. For a total of three units of housing where only one in the past has been allowed by the local government. AB 68 takes away our city council's power to impose conditions such as parking requirements. It also prevents our council from imposing size and setback requirements 
for the new construction of those conditions would be more restrictive than the new state law. Also in discussion, AB 881. Governor Newsom and his merry band of men and women want to turn quiet streets of single-family homes into teething, low-rise tenements lined with double-parked cars. When Assemblywoman Laura Friedman, Friedman excuse me, was on the Design Review Board and on City Council, she felt strongly about architectural conformity, design and construction, and other issues. Today, she cares less about architectural conformity design and construction, but about making money, 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 and destroying single-family neighborhoods, including historic districts of Glendale. The new housing rules imposed by the state progressive Democrats have upended the state's suburban-style neighborhoods. When our, neighbor, neighbor, excuse me, when our neighbors replace their rear lawns, remove their pools, convert their garages and carports, and have cargo containers in their driveways without requiring additional parking, what a hodgepodge of a neighborhood will have been created. The new California Welcome to Glendale included. It is unfortunate there are many Glendale residents in Adams Hill and Northwest Glendale still supporting Laura Friedman. Council members, please, please, please listen to your constituents and turn down the state's mandated housing and join other cities to sue the state of California for their poorly written laws. Laura Friedman is a disgrace to our community and for all California. She is no different than her friend and convicted felon friend, John Draymond. It's all about making money. Council members, here is a flyer I just picked up the other day about a house that's up for sale. In the back it says, ADU available, right here. It started Thank already. Thank you, Mr. And I'm going to give you this flyer. It's over here on Windsor Street, we'll Winchester. That in the record. Mm. Kathy Yurka, followed by Susan Wolfson. Good evening, Mayor Nigerian and members of the City Council. Um, thank you for asking staff to return to you with an urgency ordinance on AG, ADUs so that um, Glendale can begin to reckon with um, the really distressing uh, changes that the state has mandated um, for the second time in, in a couple of years. And I also want to thank staff for their work on it and thanks to you, Mr. Garcia, for responding to my questions. Um, in a way that I completely understood <laughs> and had no follow-ups. Um, so that was, that was very useful. Um, I, you can remember when we, Glendale passed the ADU ordinance two years ago, how many people were here because they were so upset. Um, and I think that people were very pleased with the ordinance that you came up with. And they also understand that this really is the state's mandate and they're forcing you to do things that you um, would not choose to do. Um, I, I do have a, just a couple of thoughts. Um, the main one that I'll share with you is that this has to do with the issue about garages and setbacks. Um, currently, if you want to build a new garage, um, e garages are exempt from interior setbacks. Um, they can be built essentially on the property line. Um, and then those brand new garages can be converted into ADUs. And in fact, I have a friend whose next door neighbor um, is uh, doing a new building, new, new property um, on the lot and to put a garage in a one foot from the property line and announced to my friend that uh, as soon as the inspections are done, he's going to convert that garage to an ADU. And that's perfectly legal because it will be an existing garage. So now that any garage can essentially be a, a residence, I think that it really behoo, and it, this speaks to the concerns that you were expressing about um, about buildings being right on the property line, is I think that we should impose interior uh, setbacks on garages. I think a standard interior setback is six feet. There's no reason that garages shouldn't be built um, six feet from the property line. So if and when the owner does turn it into an ADU, um, they're not really encroaching on, um, on their next door neighbors. The other thing I wanted to suggest is one of the real um, 
contradictions and confusions about the law is you can limit where ADUs are based on public safety, but at the same time, it seems like you have to allow 800 square feet ADUs anywhere. I think that the state is going to have to clarify the law. I really would urge you to start thinking about hillside areas, fire prone areas that you would like to exempt from ADUs um, because of traffic flow and public safety issues in terms of getting emergency vehicles um, up and down because there are areas where that is, um, it, it's a concern now without um, the additional traffic from ADUs. Um, I guess that's it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Susan Wolfson. Good evening. I'm Susan Wolfson, Glendale homeowner for 12 years, and um, I want to thank you for your service and the opportunity to address you tonight. Um, you're deciding how to respond tonight to AB 68 and AB 881. These bills clearly paved the way for Senate Bill 50, which was shelved and which will be um, brought back next year. They spell doom for single-family neighborhoods in California and will irreversibly alter the quality of life that makes our state so attractive. These bills override previously enacted local ordinances, explicitly mentioning off-site parking requirements, historic preservation, design requirements, and basic zoning rules. This is a violation of local agencies' right to legislate and seems illegal to me. After all, aren't cities legitimate entities with duly elected officials? How can the state be allowed to disregard the will of local voters? This is akin to the federal government dictating that California laws are invalid. Consider how we would feel if the federal government said that California laws about gun control or environmental laws are invalid just because federal officials oppose them. Equally disheartening is the fact that some of these bills are co-authored by a former Glendale council member. It seems that once people move on to bigger things, they lose their enthusiasm for our local concerns, which saddens me. But above all, please connect the dots in order to fully understand the impact of these bills. They will not immediately overwhelm us, but they will escalate. Um, as has been pointed out already, real estate brochures are touting the potential for development and describing listed properties as ADU ready and so that sort of thing. These bills essentially disallow local zoning ordinances, run roughshod over historic preservation and disregard off-street parking and other requirements. Um, the home into which we have poured our life savings, which we may have scrimped and saved for decades to afford, may be soon uh, adjacent to noisy, multifamily residences. Um, this will deprive us of the quiet enjoyment and will change the nature of our entire civic ecosystem. Um, the argument is made that we haven't built sufficient housing. I don't believe that ruining single-family residential neighborhoods is going to result in adequate housing to solve our housing shortage. Um, therefore, I implore you, please, join with other cities to use any and all means, including litigation, to protect your constituents and the rights of local governments. AB 68, 881, SB 330, and other bills of this ilk are attacks on smaller governments by the state. They will destroy something irreplaceable. Um, if these neighborhoods go, how can we ever recreate them? Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other cards. Do we have comments? Mr. Quintero. questions. How about joining the lawsuit, Mr. City Attorney? Yeah. What are the prospects of uh, municipalities winning? Uh, well, first of all, what exactly are they uh, suing the state for? Um, you know, I'm not sure on, on this bill. I'm not sure what the challenge would be. It's very, it'd be the state has um, the authority to impose additional land use regulations um, upon cities in most cases. Um, generally speaking, the Land use power emanates from a, a section of the Constitution, the California Constitution, which the, the courts have held. The state also has the authority to impose regulations that can trump local regulations. So well, I'll, I'll look into it. Okay, yeah, it'd be interesting to know. Uh, the next question I have is on the garage setback, which sounds like a 
good idea, at least in some applications, depending on lot size and so forth. What or what would be the the negative if the city council decided to do the five or six foot setback? I, I go ahead, Ms. Ass. Um, I think there could just be some unintended consequences of moving the garage over, um, pulling into your driveway, in theory, past your house, um, and into the into the garage would eat up more of the rear yard. So that's basic. That would be I, it. And I mean, there's maybe something I'm not yeah. thinking of. And, but and well, one of the things, Mr. Quintero, is it may it may force somebody, especially in new construction, to alter their house. Because you need a certain amount of backup space. Yeah. If you were going to move it all over, say it's in the back, you'd have to pull in and go like that. You'd have to have enough distance there, which might encroach on the new home. So you're, you, you made, as you said, uh, unintended consequences of trying to set up a design parameter on the chance that there's an ADU that's built there. Um, if it's a J, if it's uh, attached and next to, you just move your whole house six feet over. You, you reduce that size of the house by six feet. That could have a big impact on the design of how somebody yeah. lays out their house. All right, and then uh, there was a question or a comment, and I absolutely agree in terms of hillside areas and the safety of having one more unit. Um, I think that's something we could explore. But I'm also curious, how would this affect, or how are ADUs going to affect our hillside ordinance? Worked on it for years to come up with the different designs, and how's that going to work? So, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Councilmember Quintero, um, the point is well taken, and I think in, uh, Ms. Yurka hit on the, the, the problem with the statute, which is, um, we can apply the, in the normal course, we can apply the hillside standards, or at least the, hill, the code provisions, but when somebody wants to apply for one of those mandatory ADUs, unless there's an actual health and safety problem with it, such as something like it, it uh, you know, the city engineer or the building official wouldn't be willing to issue a, a grading permit for it because of that type of issue, not just not out of compliance with the code, um, it appears we have to approve that ADU Regardless, the only the only standards and like the one of subsection B that Ms. Asp went over was just it's 800 square feet, 16 feet in height, four foot setbacks. We have to approve it um, unless there's a, a severe enough health or safety risk that a building official wouldn't issue a building permit or grading permit for for the structure. If I, Ms. Devine, but but can we um, can we use traffic flow concerns, safety, a first responders' ability to get to uh, because of correct you know, so parking and right well if that's something the council wants us to look at we can look at that okay, when we because that'll be part of the initiation and you you obviously would have to have some some indication of where those areas would be well, how they would be so impacted but again keep in mind that there's the first section of the statute which says here are the standards you you can impose here are the areas where you can look at including traffic flow and public safety and whatnot but then it says notwithstanding the, the statute literally says notwithstanding all of that you have to approve this so even in those areas where we can identify that's not necessarily the best place to put an ADU because of traffic flow issues or water or sewer, you still have to approve them um, in, in, under one of those four scenarios. And, and, and then, like, let's say we don't approve it, then they could sue? Is that the we'd be out of, we, Yeah, there'd be you know, legal risk because you'd be out of compliance yeah. with, with the statute. Okay. Thank you. Any other, Mr. Garbetian? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have several questions. Um, I'm just going to go over it. I wrote them down in that particular order. Uh, as far as the meters go, uh, it was mentioned that they don't have to have a separate meter, but if they want to have a separate meter, would they allow it or not? Yeah, I mean, if they want to and it complies with, okay. with the, the you know, rules and regs of GWP, we, could, we would allow it. Okay, and also on the on the hillside uh, issue, there is a, a mention to it on, on page 7, but at the end we say we require to approve ADU's application in all residential zones because 
as you mentioned, the only way we can, we can deny them is health and safety issues and public safety issues and, and uh, the grading and everything else, right, on the hillside areas. Because it will be very difficult to build anything on the hillside, uh, especially with the hillside ordinance. Hillside ordinance still will, will, will apply, right, for an ADU in a hillside area? It'll apply to somebody who wants to build an ADU more than 800 square feet with a 16-foot height limit and 4-foot. Then we can, we, we can apply all the development standards in our code. But if they want to just build that 18, eight, excuse me, 800 square foot, they, they don't have to comply with any of the, the hillside design guidelines, uh, hillside requirements, such as you can only have so much FAR depending on, on the slope of your property, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, also, the enforcement on the buildings that have violations on are still five years, right? Because I was looking through it, it's on page seven again. Uh, the the five year non enforcement correct right, so -enforcement. If there's a notice of violation they can request that the city not enforce it for a five year period and that statute is in effect for 15 years and for the first 10 years of that 15 years now uh, the property owner can request that sort of abeyance okay and on page eight it mentions that um, prohibits an owner of a lot with an ADU or JADU from building and accessory living quarters for accessory buildings, the except, exception of residential garages. So if you have an ADU and you have room in your in your lot, you can build, how can I ask this question? If you have a house with two car garage and you build an ADU in the back of your property, right? And if you're a responsible person, you wanna build another garage for your ADU, is that allowed? We make an exception to that rule for garages, correct? Yes, so and but but you couldn't build an addition. So the current rule that we have is you can have a, a guest house or another accessory quarters or an ADU, but not both. But now we can't enforce that under the new law. You can always have the ADU. So that we, what the staff's proposing is you can if you have the ADU that you don't get any of the other stuff. But the exception to that is garages. So that's why I, I, I wanted to clarify because it's in here and I want right. to understand it. So if you have a house with a two car garage, you build an ADU. Uh, you can also build a, a garage for your ADU, basically. Correct. You can build a yeah. garage for your cars right. yeah. in addition to the ADU. You right. would not be able to build a pool house. No, no, I understand that. No, I understand that. Um, just a garage. You can build a garage with, within your... But does that have to comply with the FAR, that garage? Yeah. Yes. So the ADU doesn't have to comply with the FAR... But the garage has to comply with the FAR? Because our, our, our standard zoning rules, you get a 500 square foot exemption for garages. Anything that exceeds that, in your example. I got it. I got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> I remember that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the 800 square foot minimum, right? Uh, the state mandates that we have to allow 800 square foot. And is this a, because we discussed this, uh, a year ago, on 500 square feet, is it is it a net square foot? What do they mandate? Is it net square foot, or is the exterior the perimeter of? We we would interpret it the way we interpret square footage was you measure the exterior, the exterior of the building. So it's the exterior, okay? Because it's going to be a question in the future. I want to I want to understand what you're, you're voting for, which is good. Also on. Uh, The historic districts. I want to make sure that it, this I'm reading this correctly, and it's in the in the in the. This is part of our our uh, current ordinance that we approved last time, when we mentioned that it cannot be visible, the ADU cannot be visible from the street or the sidewalk or right away. Basically, is it still in place? That that rule is still in place, with the exception of that mandatory ADU that if. They can sh if they can't build it well with complying with that they they have the right to build that 800 square foot ADU. So that the rule is not in place. It's in place to the extent that they can't. It, it's a, it's in place to the extent that they don't want to build that that 800 square foot. They want to build something bigger. Or they can't. They don't. They don't want to comply with um, one of the other development standards. Um, or they they if they want to build that by right ADU, then it's not in place. Or wouldn't be in place because the state law would so preempt. This supersedes the 
state law supersedes our current ordinance that says the ADU cannot be visible from the street. That that part of the state law would, would preempt us, yes. Okay. So if if they want to convert their garage and the garage is at the end of the drive and it's visible, it's allowed now versus before we could have said no because it's visible from the Correct. public right away. No, well, that's not good. None of this uh, is good. Sorry? None I know, I know. Good. I mean this is this is None this is gonna create a create a huge issue for us as far as uh, uh, and one, 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 one more question about the existing uh, permitted, what do they call them, granny units that we had in the past. If they pull their permits to convert them into ADUs, it's assuming that it was permit built, you know, with permits, converting them into ADUs today. If they pull the permits after January 2020, it, the fees do not apply to them. Because when they built it, they paid fees, right? Correct. So maybe they built it, I don't know, 20 years ago. But it's permitted. So uh, you mean like a guest house? Guest house. Right. Um, with, uh, there's a question about the impact fee? The impact fees. Um, so if it's less than 750 square feet, they wouldn't have to pay an impact fee. And if it's more than seven, if 750 feet, square feet or more, they'll have to pay it uh in proportion to the size of the single family dwelling but not to exceed 4700 that's that's what staff's recommending okay and uh one last question mr mayor uh the the junior adus do they have to have their own because where did i read it it says uh, they can share uh, to include separate sanitation facilities with the existing structure or share sanitation facilities with the existing structure so if you have a house, you have an ADU attached to your house, a junior ADU, you can share your the restroom of the house, or you have to have a separate uh, restroom and a kitchen or kitchenette for your j junior ADU. Um, I think so. We can require a kitchenette, but I think the state law allows them to share sanitation facilities, which include bathrooms. That's why it's juniors. That's right. No, I, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're lucky that's now that we're going to have sure. to have a sink in the Knock on right. the door. That's what I was going to say. Now you know, we have the, to have a sink. The, the, Thank you. Yeah, the previous ordinance that was mandated, it said that... Uh, Everything was separate. Yeah. yeah. But no, the one that said you can have a, a, a drain pipe, right. one and a half inch, but you don't have to have a sink. And I don't understand why would you have a drain pipe if, you don't, if you're not going to have a sink, or why have a kitchen if you're not going to have a sink. So... Sorry? <laughs> no comments, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Okay, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank comment. you. Mr. Quintero. The 800 square feet could also be a two-story as long as you've got the 16-foot. Uh, yeah, but I don't, you can't do two stories in 16 feet. 16 feet. No. Yeah. Well, so 800 square feet then has to be even <coughs> Would be a single a story. Would be single. In 16 feet? That's no. Wouldn't, to do. wouldn't work. Okay, so the 800 square feet is going to have to be a single, a single story. story. Correct. Question. Mr. Vine. A couple questions. In the historic districts and with a historic contributor home, uh, our ordinance said that architecturally they had to be the same. Compatible. Compatible. Thank you. Do, is, does that hold true now? Did we leave that? Did we leave that in there? The architectural compatibility? Compatibility uh, architecturally. Let's say that it's a historic home and they put an ADU and, you know, council. Come, oh, come yeah. So, the, uh, yeah. So, for the, for the units that are over 800 square feet, we, we maintain that requirement. Um, it is exempt, again, under that mandatory ADU provision. Okay. Good. Um, I'm well, sure the staff will be doing all it can to try to get uh, property owners to okay. make it consistent. Especially if they're visible, like you're right. saying they right. could be. Correct. Okay, great. Good, good. Uh, I, this is kind of contradictory. Uh, the um, mandatory ADU approvals, it says the interior setbacks are, must be sufficient for fire and safety. And yet, when we were talking about initiating a zoning code change, because of fire and safety flow and uh, ability to, uh, uh, to uh, get through these narrow streets, you're saying that we probably couldn't uphold that? Or if, if we decide on a code change? Well, the, the 
sufficient for fire safety. That's for the first type of mandatory ADU, if I'm not mistaken. Right, yes. So that's the one where you're going to have the ADU, uh, either an accessor dwelling unit or a junior accessor dwelling unit um, included within existing single family structure or existing accessory structure. In that case, we can impose a, a setback requirement of sufficient for fire safety and as as Kristen noted uh, our, our building and safety division said that that under the building safety code that that number is three feet um, but that the other part of it the uh, just the ma mandatory the other mandatory to use it's not necessarily required beyond the yeah. uh, four feet interior setbacks well, I, I just find it contradictory that there, in one case that say fire and safety is important and then in the other one that they're saying there, that uh, there is a lot that's contradictory and it's frustrating I mean, not just from uh, uh, you as policymakers having to deal with the substance of this, us just trying to interpret it and apply it will be very difficult as well. Yeah, yeah. And the other uh, note I wanted to make to point out is that it prohibits ADUs and, and junior ADUs from acting as short-term rentals. And that's check. <laughs> Good. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yeah. That is that that's actually required that. for the. Um, Junior ADUs and it's required for the mandatory ADUs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we're imposing it for all ADUs as a, as a condition of sorting. Okay. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, we have the item before us and we have options. So we're looking at 8E1. Yeah. So one is the motion to direct a, a code amendment. And so if you have you know, what we've heard so far is look at the hillside areas, looked at the categories that are listed in the statute, so we would do that. Um, if there's any other comments, then yeah, we're free to hear them, but that would be the motion on that one. And then the item is the urgency ordinance that needs to be introduced. So the, would those, excuse me, would those be the zoning code changes? Correct. Okay. Why are we, uh, why is it an urgency ordinance? So, the, again, one of the confusing parts of the legislation, there's a provision of this bill which says, if you have a, 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 any provision of your ordinance which is inconsistent with subdivision A of the new statute, and we, there are arguably some inconsistency, then your whole ordinance is invalid. So our, all of our current development standards would be wiped out if we didn't have something in place. So we, we want to have January it. 1st. January 1st. That's our deadline. That's what it's. Uh, does someone want to move 8E1 with the um, amendments? I, I move 8E1 and 2, or 1. Mayor, Mayor, can't you just say we want, we want to sue the state rather than I'm, Hey, man, I'm what, sorry. what is this? It's I'm sorry, and I just Mr. Mohan. I appreciate your interest in the item, but uh, we, can't, we can't go back and forth like that. Um, eight. So 8E1. Eight no. e one. One. Is initiating an amendment to the zoning code to take into account the factors, including... Um, Public safety, traffic flow, water, sewer, um, looking at hillside uh, compatibility, looking at the garage issue, I think, was another one. Those are the items that I've heard. I'll so second far. that. Okay. And does someone want to introduce? Uh, well, that one we need a motion. Oh, is this introducing it? Yeah. Well, so I wanted to get the introduction okay. in. And now we have, a, we have a roll call on 8E1. Councilmember Devine? Yes. Garpetian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Agajanian? Yes. Mayor Najarian? Yes. And just to be clear, Mr. Garcia, that uh, if we were not to pass this uh, as an urgency motion and January 1st were to come and go, and we were to, let's say, we're fighting this in court, et cetera, uh, we would risk right. so losing you, you, any you control. You'd risk lose, defaulting to all the state standards. So, for example, you're permitted to build an ADU uh, up to... 50% uh, of the size of your primary dwelling or 1,200 feet. Um, there's some other provisions that you, you'd be stuck with if you didn't have an ordinance that complied. Are we precluded uh, anyway from passing this and then challenging the state law? No. I think I we think. can still challenge yeah, the state absolutely. law. Yeah, but we're just locking in what we can at, at this point. Okay, so 8E1. Eight, uh, eight eight, one, eight, one more two was, question. Um, where is Los Angeles on this? Have they passed any ordinances, or what are they doing? Are they defaulting to the state? I'm not. A, I'm not aware of what they're doing. They're they defaulting follow, to the state. They follow state all the time. Right. Do you still knows. want to take a recess? Or do you no, want, no, I'm okay. you're okay. Okay. Um, so the next item is eight E 
three. Was that read into the record? It was. Okay, so I am uh, recusing myself due to a conflict mm -hmm. of interest. Where do I go? Are we going to take a vote <laughs> on the... On the first two? Oh, the roll call. First I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We didn't do the roll call. Did we do the Yeah, we did. On 81. Eight, we, we did, did on 81. 82 is an introduction, so that's been introduced. So 8E3 is left, and that's what I have a conflict on. Okay. That's Where can uh, I go? This isn't uh, like our old room. Where I could just go to the back room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will lose and use this with my left hand. So, so now we're going to talk about 8E3. Sure. So, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and uh, members of the council, the item was a request to consider um, whether the folks that the, there are <coughs> uh, 166 ADU permits that have been issued since the time that the city has has uh, legalized them. 83 of those have received final certificates of occupancy. Um, there's another 83 that are, have a permit or somewhere in the, in the process of construction. And the question that the council wanted to ask was, for those people that have permits but haven't finaled, um, should the development impact fee of $4,700 collected for all of those units uh, be refunded uh, prior to receiving a certificate of occupancy? So uh, 83 permits, uh, $4,700, it's approximately $390,000, um, and that is that is the question that was we were asked to bring back uh, to you. Um, the other 83, there's another 83, obviously, that already received their certificate of, of, of occupancy. Um, but council's mm -hmm. free to have discussion on that as well. Mr. Quintero. Okay, well, people who build ADUs, while some might be building them for their elderly parents or their younger children or older children, I think it's probably the case that most people are building ADUs to get into the rental business. And in fact, uh, it's probably going to be, it's going to work out well for them. Uh, so for me, these uh, fees that have been paid, real people are going to occupy these ADUs. They're going to use our parks, they're going to use the libraries. That's why we passed those fees to begin with. So I don't see any reason to uh, return the money. They went in thinking they were going to, or knowing they were going to have to pay those uh, fees. It so happens that now there's the opportunity for them to get a refund, but I'm not forgiving uh, anyone a refund. It comes to $390,000, and that money can be used uh, for parks and uh, libraries, et cetera. So for me, I'm going to vote no on a uh, refund. Uh, there are two portion to this. I'm sorry. One is those who have paid and everything yeah, is Yeah, either way. Done. They're in the rental business. <laughs> no, I'm saying there are a group of people that just started. They're in process. Right. So we have to separate them, I guess. He, okay, well, we may have to do that legally, but for me, it's the same. They went into building the ADU. They knew what the fees were. And so I don't see any reason to, to go for a, a refund. Like I say, new people are coming in to occupy those units that are going to be using the parks and using the, uh, the library. So I'm not into any refunds. Yes. Well, I, I'm sorry. I have to take the other, the other uh, stand. And um, I think that it would only be fair to uh, refund their uh, their fees uh, you know I know if I was in that situation and and I had put put out all of this money and then all of a sudden the law changed on me like that then I would see that this just isn't fair <coughs> so I'm for um, refunding the fees uh, do, again the question comes we don't separate those who are in process they paid and they're in process and those let's say no, a few whoever. months ago, they finished, they paid, and no, I it's think the they same. Should, yes, I think they should okay. all be refunded. All right. Including the, the um, just so I'm clear yes. for the record, including the individuals or, or families who've received their certificate of occupancy. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, council members are so, yeah, People who have their CFOs yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for council's verification, that's about. 250 units 
2017. No, I, I, it's, well, we, I, my understanding is that there's about 270 people that have gone through the process at some point, like try, applied for a permit. There's 83 that have permits but don't have a CFO. There's another 83 that have their CFO. So you're doubling the number. So it's going to be how many people will get a refund? 166. And, and that's 375,000? That would be, no, that would be about 800,000, 700, 780,000. Wow. That's a big number. That's a big number. That's what I was trying to say. Those who are, the permits, had, they got their per, permits yeah. and they are done. Okay, uh, those that are in the process then should yeah. be should Those who are in any refunded. stage of yeah. process. Yes, yeah. Any stage of process. No, there are two types. Mistake. Either Either the ones that they haven't, they're in the process of submitting their applications or mm -hmm. reviewing their applications. They're not going to move forward because they have to wait another right. month. They, the question was between the ones that have a certificate of occupancy. It means they, they had a permit. They completed their, their, their construction. They almost moved in, and they have a certificate of occupancy. The difference between them and the ones that are in construction, they, have, they don't have a certificate of occupancy. Well, the, the ones that are in process, they haven't paid the fee yet. Yeah. Yeah, the ones that are just, their, their permit is being reviewed by the city, they haven't paid their no, fee No, no, the ones that are in construction, they right. paid the fee. I think you're talking that's about two what, things. Yeah. That's yeah. why you're, right. you're referring to, Correct. not the ones that are talking to, to the right. city. They haven't paid the fees yet, the ones that are in process. The ones that are in, in, in the process of building their building, they paid the fees already, and the ones that they have the certificate of occupancy, which means they, they completed their construction, they paid the fees as well. So there are two kinds. One, the right. finished construction, have a certificate of That's occupancy. To that, that has the ones that they don't have a, a certificate of occupancy, and the construction may not finish by next. But they've already paid their fees? They already paid their fees. The construction may not yeah. finish uh, by, by two months, end of January. Yeah. So they will mm -hmm. fall under this thing. So for me, I think okay. I, I'm with Mr. Quintero in a way that we don't want to give up everything we, yeah. we took. Uh, Maybe the ones that are in construction only, but uh, I can go either way. It's just, yeah. you know. No, why just, we don't just, do this? Those who they, their building has finished, they have certificate of occupancy, yeah. and the money is paid, everything is done, mm -hmm. will not get the money back. Correct. They won't get the refund. I, I would go All ahead. others in any stage of process, they should get their refund. Yeah. The ones that they pay the fees already. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, I'd go for that one. I'd go okay. for that. That would be 83. So, yeah. So what I'm hearing um, mostly is that uh, desire for a motion. The motion would be to, we have to, because we have to bring back a resolution to do this, but the motion would be to re to take the actions to refund the Parks and Library Development Impact Fee for those folks that have paid their permit fees and their Development Impact Fee, but yet not yet received a certificate of, so of occupancy. occupancy. Yes. Right. Is that the motion? That's fine. Right. So moved. I'll move that. Do we have a second for that? Do you need a second for yes. that? Yes. I second. Any roll call? Councilmember Devine? Yes. Garpetian? Yes. Quintero? No. Mayor Pro Tem Magajanian? Yes. Mayor Najarian? That's it. We'll get the mayor back. Where is the mayor? So. Next item. Okay. Thank you. A next item, please. Mayor, next item is uh, nine hearings. A and B will be read together. Uh, 9A would be Director of Community Development regarding 1235 Glenwood Road. Glendale Register Nomination and Mills Act Application. One resolution to list 1235 Glenwood Road on Glendale Register of Historic Resources and authorize a Mills Act contract between the owner and the city. Two, motion to not list 1235 Glenwood Road on the Glendale Register of Historic Resources and not, not authorize a Mills Act contract between the owner and the city. B would be Director of Community Development regarding 1818 Casa Glen Drive, Glendale Register nomination and Mills Act application. One resolution to list 1818 Casa Glen Drive on the Glendale Register of Historic Resources and authorize a Mills Act contract between the owner and the city. 
Thank you. And this is. I have one more. Did you do B2? Uh, B2 would be motion to, uh, not, motion list to not list 1818 Pasa Glen Drive, the Northern Register of Historic Resources, and not authorize the Mills Act contract between the owner and the city. Great. Uh, this is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing and go to Ms. Beers. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we'll go directly to Mr. Platt. Mr. Will Platt. Be uh, with your permission, I'll try to be less apocalyptic and share some good news, which is Mills Act contracts, we believe. Um, make properties not subject to all of the ADU discussion you just had. It may be the only mm -hmm. way out of this, so yeah. that's one thing to think about. <laughs> that's and one plus. It is yeah. a plus. That, well, there are many That's pluses. the best news there we've heard today. Pluses, but in tonight's context, Thank it's you. the one, so. Oh. That's the wrong one. That was last one. week. Yeah, that's last time. That was last this week. <laughs> That's from the past. <laughs> okay, we have uh, two properties. I'll go through the slides quickly just so you get a sense of these. First property is 1235 Glenwood Road. Uh, we're calling it the Cole Carruthers House to memorialize the first owner of the house who built it in 1910 and as well as the family that moved the house to its current location in 1931. It's a craftsman-style house, very prominent corner. You've probably driven past it many times at Grandview and Glenwood. Uh, it features many interesting uh, craftsman uh, character-defining features. It's also quite early as a 1910 property uh, for the craftsman style anywhere in Glendale, but especially in, in this neighborhood, though there are others. Um, among, well, just to give the personal touch, we see the Carruthers clan gathering at the property. Um, when the house was built in 1910, it was built on Orange Street, just north of Broadway, where the Department of Social Services building is now. Um, it was moved, we think, by the Ralph's Grocery Company, which owned some of the land. Um, they were basically getting people to buy the houses so they could be moved, so they could expand their market, and a little bit of that history is a bit murky. Um, but anyways, the house at the uh, location it is today still maintains many of these features that it had in 1910. It has interesting shingle siding in the gables, uh, these brackets, um, a lot of the, uh, just the form and shape, the steeply pitched roof, which is characteristic of earlier craftsmen and kind of went away with later craftsmen. It uh, has many of its original windows, though some have been changed. So here you can see on the front of the house, there are windows, sorry. Windows that have uh, leaded glass, which is not a typical feature for craftsmen. We have divided light windows with these perimeter grids. This house has its original front door still. And when we come around to the, the porch area, it looks very much like we believe it looked originally, but the siding material that you could see on both the face of this porch and the inside is a more modern material. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission, which uh, unanimously recommended that this house be designated, um, did attach a condition that this material be investigated, probably removed and replaced with wood siding, but during that investigation, we're going to look at it more closely to see if there may be some other treatment that was there. If we find that, we'll bring it back to HPC and, and see if they can approve the, uh, a, a different material. On the rear of the house and then the side of the house that faces the neighbor rather than the street, um, the windows have been replaced. So a total of 12 windows were replaced. And uh, as part of the conditions, the HPC uh, recommended that the owners um, have a contract condition for replacement of all of these windows. The nice thing is we know what the original windows look like, so it's an easy matter to replace these. And it's a, it's a nice way to remember how the Mills Act really can bring these properties back to, to where they were. Uh, there was one other condition. There's a fence, kind of a modern fence that a previous owner built. And the commission felt that the right-hand section of this, which I've highlighted here, is kind of interferes with the look of the house from the street. So they accepted that the rest of the fence be maintained, but just that this highlighted part be removed, and then the fence be painted. Uh, the owners have already begun the painting process for the fence, and they've agreed to all of the conditions that the uh, commission is recommending that you apply for the contract. Can you explain that again? Will that fence be removed there, the white portion? The white portion of the fence, which you see there, removed. will be removed, and then there'll be a little return side of the fence. It's similar to the property we saw last time we looked at these. 
there'll be a little return section of mm. fence, so their backyard is still going to be enclosed, mm. but the side of the house will be exposed. So that's all I have on this house, unless you have questions. I don't have any questions. Okay. Um, here are the conditions. Uh, another condition was to paint the entire house, and then there's one door um, that's just kind of utilitarian side door that the commission wanted to see as a, a more appropriate door, but still a simple uh, utilitarian door to re be a replacement. Uh, the second house um, is very different from many of the properties we've seen. Uh, this is 1818 Passa Glen. We're calling it the Wittick House after the family that built the house, literally built the house, and lived in it for many, many decades. Um, I give a time range for the construction of the house, which you don't usually do, but that's kind of part of the interesting story of this house. And com it's fun to compare this to the Craftsman, where we think Craftsman houses show a lot of craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. This is truly a handcrafted house. Um, the couple that built it, Mr. and Mrs. Wittick, um, were influenced by some styles that were popular in Glendale, the English Revival and French Revival. The house is really quite unique. It doesn't fit into any specific style, which is not an issue. It actually makes it more interesting in a lot of ways. And you can see it's in a heavily landscaped, wooded, kind of naturalistic site. Um, here's Mr. Wittick's um, shingle. He was, his, he was a builder and a designer. Um, he built the house, he designed the house for his family. They kind of improvised as they worked on it over time. And during the war years, they actually were using recycled materials from one of his side jobs. So it's kind of an interesting story of how houses could be developed at that period. And it's got a lot of interesting features that we don't see on most other houses. There's a lot of interesting woodwork. And it was almost as if he was showing off his talents. I, I kind of look at this as kind of a calling card where he was kind of maybe selling himself for prospective clients to see what he could do. And every vantage point of the house gives kind of a different perspective. It doesn't look like much else that we have in Glendale. And so this is the back of the house, kind of emphasizes the very natural setting that the house uh, finds itself in. And the wonderful thing is the current owners um, received a trove of materials from the original family. They, they're the second owners, so they bought the house from the Wittick family. Wow. So they documented their construction really thoroughly. We don't have a lot of examples of that for our other designated properties. So we have this kind of scrapbook of images of Mr. and Mrs. Wittick building the house with their friends. Mrs. Wittick was involved in the construction and, and you know, it was a family affair, basically. There are also interesting features of wood. This is a rain gutter at the top left that's made out of wood, but then it's lined with metal. Mr. Wittick was not only a really talented woodworker, but he was also a metalsmith, so there's kind of original metal fixtures and finishes that he uh, used for the house. And then I just wanted to close, because this is such a wonderful <coughs> set of images. 1949, we had a nice snowfall in Glendale. And when you see this house in the snowfall, it just looks like you're in Wrightwood or mm -hmm. somewhere else. It's, it's kind of amazing. Uh, this house is very much in its original condition. The uh, Preservation Commission recommended that there are, most of the house is stained wood, so there's not a lot of paint on it, but there are a few elements that are painted, so they recommended that all of those previously painted uh, pieces of the house be repainted. And that, <coughs> the That's owners of both properties are here if you have any questions. Where's the, where's uh, the Passa Glen Drive? Is that in? <coughs> Woodlands? Yeah, it's in the woodlands on the, on the east side of the canyon. It's a funny little street where another street was built just below it. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a card from Michael Morgan. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, <laughs> Madam City Manager, staff, residents. My name is Michael Morgan, a longtime resident of Glendale. I'm a commissioner on the Historic Preservation Commission for over 10 years, but I'm speaking as an individual. The two houses that you have before you, nominated by the Historic Preservation Commission, are, dare I say, unique in Glendale and deserve to be on the Glendale Register of Historic Resources. I rarely come to speak in front of the City Council about nominated properties, but the two are wonderful examples of pre-World War I, the Great War, and another built during World War II. 
The first, 1235 Glenwood Road, a pre-World War I craftsman house that was moved from its original construction site near Broadway to 1235 Glenwood, and because of that, it has been saved from demolition. It has also been saved because both Hannah and Seth were now their owners. Um, the house has found them, and Glendale is richer for it. Think of it, a house as wonderful in shape as earlier Glendale. Sit on its wraparound porch and relax to a s simpler time. City Council, please vote to list this on the Glendale Register for future residents to enjoy. And then I'd like to say a little bit about the other house. And the other, another unique house, 1818 Pasa Glen, was a house built during World War II. Glendale has many pre-war and post-war but practically none built during the, during the war. Imagine trying to build a house with almost nothing, with war-related shortages of building materials. The builder, Mr. William Wittick, managed to do so, and what a house he crafted. A tour of the inside shows all the materials Mr. Wittick found and used, creating an interior that uses every nook and cranny, cranny judiciously. Again, the house found new great owners, Shauna and Brooks, as I mentioned earlier, I have been on the commission for 10 years and never have been as enchanted at a house as much as this one. Please, oh please, list this house on the Glendale Register, Resolution 9B1. Thank you very much, and I'd also like to see you all at the Christmas Parade come this weekend. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any other cards. Is there any discussion? Mr. Quintero. I just want to say that the owners of uh, Passa Glen, I want to thank them. I assume it's you people right there. Boy, that's going to be a big project. It'll be, uh, <laughs> it'll be worth it for sure. It's just a really unique property, but you can see all the work that they're going to have to do. And, and uh, it would have been so much easier just to not uh, bring it back to to its old glory, and I'm very happy that you're doing that. So, and I'll, if there are no other comments, I'll uh, move 9A1 and 9A2. 9B1. 9A1 and 9B. Uh, yeah, you're right, 9B. Second. Any other discussion? Great well, homes. Just wanna, great, great homes. homes. I just want to mention, yeah, they're both beautiful homes, the one, especially on Grandview. And Glenwood, you you see it all the time. You're driving driving by, but some of these pictures are from old pictures. And I love the black and white pictures. But the one that uh, there's some ladies on the roof. Um, uh, yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> Jay mentioned it's a family affair. It was he wasn't he wasn't kidding. It says framing the living room dormer, uh, but I don't see any tools in her hand. Probably she was Little shaking hand. her husband to make sure that she's doing the right job. <laughs> <laughs> a, this is this is a this is a, these are great pictures. Yeah. So uh, with that. Yeah. We are, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm okay with the... Thank you. So we have the motion and the second. Roll call, please. Council members Devine? Yes. Arpedian? Yes. Montero? Yes. Agajanian? Yes. Aaron Ajayan? Yes. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is oral communication. Discussion is limited to items There's not no part tools. of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Council may question or respond to the speaker. There will be no debate or decision. Team manager may refer the matter to the appropriate department for investigation and yeah. report. First speaker is Margarita Avedisian. Well, I think everyone can use a cup of coffee. <laughs> I'll try to cut short. Uh, my office is 225 East Broadway, the old uh, DPSS office. The building is very nice, very pleasant, but recently the owners of the building are renting to people who dispense marijuana, and it's right next door to me, which affecting on my health. I was going home with palpitations, headaches, and all kinds of signs of heart attack. And then I said, no, I, it can't be heart attack. So one last week, I went to the office, and I couldn't even open my door because the smell, the fume, is, it was all over. 
and I have lots of files. Uh, I am a social worker. I have a private practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked the management to do something about it. So they said, I, I even called the police. And the police came. They saw the volume of marijuana in, in the next door office. They said, you know, if it was two years, three years ago, we could have done something. But now we don't have any rights to do anything. So I want to ask all of you, do you have any idea, like Mr. Garabetian was saying, how it's uh, affecting on students and how they suing the companies? now. My office, I've been there 10 years. I love the office. I'm planning to retire in three years and go to Armenia, but I want to make sure that something, I mean, for the future in the buildings, they, they like the professional buildings, they should not have offices rented to people who are using or dispensing or uh, fabricating or whatever, because there is no proper ventilation and air conditioning comes right into my office. So I want to know, is there any anything I can do? The, the office manager said, oh, I can move your office. I said, I can't do that because I have lots of licenses that are connected with this particular office. The address, it, to change all that information, mm -hmm. it's lots of work. So. so, so. Well, we can it's, answer you back and forth, but if you're concluded, yes, council I may have, have some comments. I just want to know what options I have as a citizen, as a consumer, as a person. Okay, why don't you have a seat? Thank you very much, because we can't go back and forth. But I know council has some questions. Yeah. Ms. Well, Devine. Um, she, she, you mentioned dispensing. Are they actually selling marijuana? Because if the police went and they were selling marijuana, there would be something we that, could do that about that. That would be that. illegal, yes. Ms. Avedisi, you can, now because now you're you getting questioned, questions. you can come forward and answer. <laughs> okay. What's happening, they said, when they rented the office, they said they are in mail order business. So apparently they, are, they have large quantity of marijuana and they are mail order, whatever they do. They don't even have their name on the roster that, uh, in the building. Okay, so we so maybe if you give us your address again, it's two two five. Is someone writing this East down? Broadway. Right, we're, East we're, Broadway. we're gonna we're gonna look up. We're okay. gonna look into a follow up. Mr. Najarian being in the building. Is this the My, uh, yes. Hollywood, Hollywood production? Yes. Yes. Oh, Hollywood. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Oh. Wow. You've mm. been there many times. I think times. we should all go uh, down and investigate. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah it, first it is. Hand. Uh, even the paper smells. Even my clothes when I go home. Uh, Okay. I always have so, to apologize to my clients that I don't smoke, don't but smoke. my next door neighbors are yes. doing something. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Avedishan. What I'm understanding from the city manager is we are going to look into that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So if you can leave your phone number um, with the I clerk, yeah, uh, please. Good question. We'll follow yes, up. Mr. But, uh, do they, do they, I'm sorry. We just want to because we can't go back and forth. I'm just going to ask you a quick question and cool. just want to. You know, short answer. Do they smoke in their unit, or they oh, have? They smoke too. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. That's all. They, they will just leave your information. They will okay. contact you. Okay. That's, That's, we could probably get them for smoking in, said, indoors before we get them for the marijuana not a possession. Cigarette. It's pot. Right. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for letting us know, and thank you for sticking around. Um, but for the future, I just want you to think how it badly affects on the humans. Yes, yes. It's worse than secret. Thank you. Next speaker is Herbert Milano.
Good evening, Mayor and Yari, members of the City Council, City staff. My name is Herbert Molano. Three years ago, on December 13th, 2016, the City Council heard a report initiated by the City staff. I took a look at the, uh, at the events of that day, looked at the video, and it seemed like this was a city-generated report to consider for the City Council banning, restricting, or taxing short-term rentals. In the 102-page report, the City staff presented to the council the following problematic trends. Party houses, noise, nuisance, health, and sanitary reasons, loss of multifamily housing, loss of affordable housing, and an opportunity to increase the transient occupancy tax revenues. But I did an assessment, and I believe that you all received this re report that I compiled during a period of four weeks. I'm not completed yet. But here's some additional information that will be in my next report for comparison. The city of Glendale has 73,000 households. Of those households, less than 500 are short-term rentals. That's a fraction of 1%. And even that fraction, according to the report, use short-term rentals of from 15 to 90 days. So it's a fraction of a fraction. And I was wondering if this suffices is that it's enough justification for you to create an ordinance as overcoming as this one is, as uh, thorough with penalties and registration fees and additional staff. So I was wondering if you have evaluated what the actual proportion of what we're dealing with here in Glendale. Now, I do believe that there are potential problems and trends that the city staff may have identified in other cities for your consideration. But I think that there are two major issues to, for you to consider. One of them is what happens to the institutional uh, investor that wants to buy single property, single family homes for the purposes of turning them into full-time or part-time uh, rentals for short-term rentals. And the other ones are the issues having to do with the financial needs of individuals that turn to short-term rental as a way of either helping to meet their mortgage or help finance finance, capital improvements, or, or other needs. So there's, a, I think, a significant difference. So my suggestion for when you do uh, bring this up next week for adoption is that, that you might want to consider creating the, uh, a, a streamlined version of this, of this proposal that was given to you by the, uh, by the city staff. And the reason why I suggest that is that you can always have an opportunity later as you get more information to tighten it up and to bring additional regulations as needed. But why start with a very large ordinance that covers so much territory for which there is no substantiation? And so my suggestion is that if you do move in that process, that you try to look at the core issues that may have an impact given the trends that the city staff recognized. And I also like to ask the, uh, the, the mayor that if you would consider allowing for public comments during this adoption. You did provide it at the introduction. It will be nice for some people to, that will be here to be able to express their concerns. I thank you very much. Thank you. And that's coming up next week, correct? Correct. Okay. You have 14 appointments. Um, <laughs> pretty busy, Mr. Quintero. <laughs> So that concludes uh, the cards I have for oral communications. Do we have any new business? I have one item. I do. Ms. Devine. I'd like to uh, move uh, that pursuant to Government Code Section 54957.1 and Article 8, Section 1 of the City Charter, the Council hereby approves the City Attorney appointment of Adam C. Phillips as Assistant City Attorney for the City of Glendale and further that a written copy of this motion be transcribed, certified, and delivered by the city clerk to the Office of the Civil Service Commission of the City of Glendale as and for the written statement required by Article 24, Section 5, Subsection 2 of the Charter. Is there a second? Second. second. Roll call, please. Council Members Devine? Yes. Arpedian? Yes. Quintero? Yes. Agajanian? Yes. Aaron Ajarian? Yes. Do we have any other new business? That concludes our business agenda. Is there a motion adjourn. to adjourn? Second. We are adjourned.